All right, good morning, folks. Uh, today is May 19th, 2023. My name is John Decker, the Director of Community Services at Alta California Regional Center. And this is Coffee with Community Services, Alta California Regional Center's weekly service provider meeting. We John, have... this is Carol, one of the interpreters. Can you make Rima a co-host as well? Yes, I certainly will. Me? Okay, she says thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. And I will make sure to spotlight Rima when I call on her, so that way we make sure that she makes it onto the video recording as well. I think we figured that out, that unless we spotlight her, we don't get to see her on the video recording. So um, real quickly, just gonna go through some of the staff that are on here. So I see uh, Alicia, our, uh, HCBS specialist, good morning. And from uh, Client Services, I see uh, one of our managers, Hannah Zong, good morning, Hannah. And let's see, Beverly from Community Services, good morning, and Isabella as well. And let's see, Shirley from Community Services, good morning. And let's see here, we've got Carly, our Client Employment Specialist, and Rima, our Deaf and Hard of Hearing Specialist, who you will hear from in just a moment here. And we've got Odelia from our Community Services Department. And let's see, I see Phil Perez, one of our Client Services Managers in Residential, and I see Michelle, client services manager, um, uh, client services manager. I'm giving you a different title today. Community services manager. Like, excuse me. Um, yeah, no surprises today. Kate Tao, good morning. And I see you here as well. And Jordan, another one of our managers. And uh, Adriana is here. So good morning. And Leah and Scott and Jason from our community services department. And we've got a bunch of other staff that are on here as well. And good morning to everyone else. If you're an Alta staff and you want to wave real quick, We'll get let folks know. There you go. Right on. Um, for the agenda today, I'm going to talk about a couple things. I'm going to um, have Rima start us off, and she's going to give us um, the word of the week and uh, some uh, Deaf Culture 101. And then we are going to get into a discussion about the DSP survey, just a reminder about that. Um, we're going to talk about uh, electronic visit verification. We're going to spend most of our time talking about the information that was presented at the budget hearings. So the assembly budget hearings and the Senate budget hearings happened this week. For those of you that did not have the pleasure of watching it um, or reading the materials related to it, um, you'll get uh, about half an hour of that, maybe 20 minutes of it from me today, going over some of the things and some of the things that are very impactful as well. Um, going to go over our upcoming public meetings, and we also just had a public meeting um, as well. And then I um, want to talk about the upcoming housing forum with uh, State Council too. And then we got a few other things we'll, we'll kind of throw in there as well, because I think I saw Carly on. And Carly, we're going to talk about the DSP Collaborative, and um, maybe I'll, I'll throw it to you once I bring up the website to kind of talk about the idea related to that. So let me just write that down as well. So without further ado, I am going to not spotlight myself anymore, and I'm going to spotlight Rima so I can throw it over to Rima. So I'm going to add a spotlight, and I'm going to get rid of myself here. All right, Rima, go ahead, please. Morning, everybody. I think some of you um, didn't see an email this morning or this week. It's coming. So I've got a draft, I'm gonna send it out soon, but we'll go ahead and we'll practice here today. So what we're going to sign today is sorry. So copy me, we're gonna to sign together. This is the hand shape, sorry. Goes in a circular motion right along the chest with a facial expression, like showing that, oh, I'm so sad, I'm so sorry. Furrowing those brows, I'm so sorry. So often they may use that like they don't understand, sorry, I don't understand, or excuse me, typically a hearing phrase, they'll say that, they'll say sorry for excuse me. So excuse me is not really used very often in the deaf culture. Then also deaf 101 culture today, the 10 tips on how to communicate with a deaf person. Don't think that a deaf person can hear you just because you increase the volume or you yell at them. 
if you mumble or your voice is low, it's like a whisper that doesn't benefit anybody anyway. So just be clear, move your mouth in a clear manner. Also, what's important is eye contact. If a person reads lips, it's important for they to see your face without any type of barrier to it. So eye contact is very important when you're interacting with a deaf person. Often when a hearing person talks, they can look one way, they can look another way, and then their hearing counterpart can also hear them. But with deaf people, we depend on our eyes. If you're engaging with somebody and the conversation's not going well, go ahead and write some simple English. Deaf people vary in their English skills. Some people are proficient and others not so much because it is a second language. So use simple English when you're engaging with a deaf person that you need to write back and forth with. Don't overemphasize your mouth or your face. That is not helpful whatsoever. Also, if a person that you're talking to prefers to lip read, speak at a normal pace, not too slow, not too fast, just at your normal pace. And they're used to watching someone speak and reading lips at a normal pace. If you speak too fast, um, that would not then be conducive to them being able to read your lips. It's also nice if you have some visual pictures, some visual aids to make your communication clear. Deaf people, we, we see in vision, we see in pictures. Also then avoid too much background noise. If you have a deaf and hard of hearing person that uses hearing aids, background noise can be very intrusive and that would prevent them from being able to hear you. So move to a quieter area if you cannot quiet the background noise. Also be patient within your interaction. You know, be relaxed. Don't tense up, just be your normal self. And then every individual is different. Not all deaf people are the same. Some prefer to speak for themselves. Some prefer to sign, some prefer to write. So check to see what their preference is. What would you prefer in our communication and follow how they prefer to communicate. In today's technology, use what you have. Speech to text is one of my favorite ways to communicate with a hearing person. Use that or type on your computer if you're near your computer and you're talking with a deaf person. Use text messaging, you know, and here like we're using here in chat, send messages back and forth to each other. Take advantage of the technology we have. And those are our 10 tips for today. Also know, let me add, that there's an awkward moment and that often happens. So hearing people don't know how to communicate. Deaf people are awkward in communicating with hearing people. Misunderstandings happen. Be patient and do not be afraid to repeat yourself. Don't drop everything. Don't stop the communication because it becomes awkward. Find out ways to communicate. Sometimes the word you're trying to say isn't understandable. Choose another word that means the same. The important thing is that understanding is taking place. People drop everything when there's an awkward moment that comes in and then we lose out. So don't stop, continue to try. We will always find a way to understand. And we know, you know, there is a resistance and to keep going and giving up is very easy. So, and always do your best. It goes a long way to doing your best. You know, you and I benefit, not just you, we both benefit in the communication. So don't give up. And that's what it is for today. Excellent. Thank you very much, Rima. All right. I am now going to go over to my next um, thing, which is I want to share that. Um, and some of you may be aware of this. I, um, I very, I'm very pleased with being able to bring on deaf and hard of hearing specialists onto our regional center. Um, 
certainly um, I feel like I learn something every time I interact with Rima and she's such a good teacher um, and she's so enthusiastic about her work. And what I do want to share though, and some of you are aware of this, is that the deaf specialist landing at the regional centers started off as a result of a lawsuit. Um, and it was a lawsuit about discrimination that had gone on by regional centers for individuals that are deaf and hard of hearing and, and related to the lack of available services um, and the ability to be able to communicate with support staff and program staff um, because of that. And so we have known for quite some time that there was going to be a, um, the, the, what the settlement of the lawsuit was going to be. And it has now been made public what the settlement of the lawsuit is. And many of you have seen this. Some of the things that are included in the lawsuit are um, having deaf and hard of hearing specialists at the regional centers um, in their positions. And also um, having the communication assessments being done of individuals with lower hearing levels. And so um, I'm gonna just put it in the chat real quick. It does have the details of the um, lawsuit settlement. And again, this just got made public this week. And so I wanted to share that um, with everyone as well. And if you wanted to have further communication about that, or if this is a, you know more of interest to you, you can always reach out directly to Rima as well. If we wanna put, Rima, maybe you could put your, your email into the chat um, because again- um, Oh, please do. Please yeah. reach out, sure. Yeah, and the lawsuit also was precipitated by the institutional isolation that was happening. Yeah. Yeah, and I also wanted to add that any resources that you need, any support, and maybe just give you some language and ideas that you may need, contact me at any time. And I'm putting my email in the chat as we as right now. Excellent. Thank you very much uh, again, Rima, for that. I know that um, Michelle Johnson came and talked with folks about filling out the DSP surveys. And I just want to encourage you all to do that as service providers. I know many folks um, were able to do it last year. There's $8,000 that you receive for doing the DSP surveys. And so all of that information is on DDS's website of where to find about the DSP surveys. Um, but I just wanted to remind folks to make sure that you are filling those out. Um, again, you know, our folks from our provider advisory committee have also been very vocal about uh, our vendors making sure that they share that information with the Department of Developmental Services so that it can influence, influence uh, future policy as it relates to direct support professionals. Um, I don't know, Carly, I just got done saying to direct support professionals, so maybe we should jump over to the website real quick and talk about that. So let's see, I am going to, whoop, where did Carly go? I lost her. The whole screen shifted. Carly, you have to start talking so I can hear your voice. Okay. Find you I'm right here. There you are. All right. So let's uh, let's uh, add a spotlight here for Carly. And um, I'm going to share my screen with the DSP Collaborative website. And all right. Are you guys seeing the DSP Collaborative website? Yep. All right. Yes. Okay. So Carly, you reached out a little bit earlier today with an idea that came up, and I was wondering if you could share it with the group. Yeah, so we, we've just had some requests um, to kind of review what some of the um, um, vendor pages look like on the DSP Collaborative, um, particularly those who have utilized the, um, um, the photos um, and, and the video um, aspects of it. Um, so Southside, you can see they've, um, um, they've included several photos here. Um, it's very eye-catching. Um, lots of information about their um, job opportunities. Um, and then, um, John, if you actually want to go over to um, UCP, because I know they were able to um, add, actually add a video to theirs. Oh, cool. So you can embed the video right into Yeah, you can embed the video. Um, that came out great. Yeah, so um, we just kind of wanted to kind of give an example of some of the um, providers that have um, utilized um, these opportunities. And you can see, um, you know, UCP and Southside, they um, added their own banner at the top. Um, the uh, um, original banner is just a, a picture of um, an individual, but you can um, personalize the banner, you can add your logo, um, you can include um, photos. Uh, photos, um, and then you can embed embed a video for anyone who goes to that page to 
um, see. Cool. So, yeah, just wanted to um, review some of these um, um, pages um, that was had been requested. I love the variety of service providers that are on here as well, right? We have all kinds of, which is, well, the hope was is that the only commonality would be that you're vendored with a regional center and that we'd have a variety of different type of services posting on here. Um, and so I think we've got 33 right now for Sacramento County. Um, but then, I mean, even in some of our other counties, we have recruitment, you know, by a number of our, so for Nevada County, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, you know, folks that have already um, posted on here. So I uh, just want to really continue uh, encouraging utilization of that. Um, we are also working um, to provide, oops, I should actually share my screen still again. Um, we're still working to provide uh, more press coverage for this. One thing, um, if you'd like, and I don't know if folks are seeing um, the news stories, but if you go to the DSP Collaborative website, you can see on there information, an interview that was done um, right before the job fair that we had on Lemon Hill a couple weeks ago. Um, and then we also have the, a flyer on here promoting the job fair that is on June 15th in Lodi. And I just, for all of you service providers that are, you know, work with Valley Mountain Regional Center and Alta California Regional Center, just we want to really encourage you to um, participate in these job fairs. Again, this is a free opportunity for you to be able to post on the job site and also a free opportunity to participate in these job fairs. And again, the first one we know was, you know, successful here in Sacramento and uh, certainly looking forward to a successful event down in Lodi as well. Um, anything else about the career expos or anything else I'm, I'm missing? And I will open that to Carly or um, also, if you know Eric or Michelle or uh, Garrett or others, um, let's see. Let me see what's going on in the chat over here. Issues trying to add my logo. Um, let's see. Try again. Also, be mindful of the size and dimensions of the images that you're uploading. Yeah, right now we have the ability to work closely with uh, Scott that is designing and um, keeping the website up to date. And so, if you want to communicate with me or, um, you know, we can definitely get uh, the information available to you as soon as possible. All right, and I am going, all right. Uh, let's see, Carly, anything else in the employment world that we wanna share about? Any other thing is upcoming that, any announcements? Yeah, we do have a another micro enterprise fair in June, on June 22nd. Um, so actually, let me pull up the flyer. Um, you're a co-host, so you should be able to share. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Is everyone seeing it? Yep, it says shop local. All right. Yeah, so if um, it will be here at the um, Alta Sacramento office, if um, you know anyone who is interested, um, we already have um, several individuals who have booked tables. We even have um, a DJ coming from CIWP who will be providing music for us. Um, it'll be a super fun event. The last one we held was very successful. So um, please spread the word. Um, anyone who is interested in having a table, um, please contact me. And I'll put my um, in information in the chat. Excellent. Thank you very much, Carly. All right. I see in the chat there, there was a question about the DSP workforce data collection. I'm going to share my screen real quickly. And I'll drop this link into the chat, uh, DDS workforce data collection. Um, there's information, there's videos of the presentations. And um, there's a specific information that they provide right on DDS's website. And so let me drop that into the chat right now. Because um, Hillary, you aren't the only one that probably wants that information. So I will put that in the chat there for everyone. All right. Um, thank you very much, Carly, for sharing about that. And again, we want to continue to encourage. Um, the plan is we're 
We're looking at trying to gather the funding to be able to fund the website at least for the next five years with the existing funds that we have right now. And that's kind of what we're working on is, is going through 2028. Um, and again, as service providers, you know, there's not a lot of free opportunities to be able to post your jobs places. Um, and we do have the, you know, funding that we're doing to um, promote the website as well. Alrighty, I am going to now jump over to, let me actually, Carly, real quickly, are you going to be attending the employment work group meeting on May 22nd? Um, DD, DDS employment work group? I believe I have a conflicting meeting, so I don't know if I will make it. All right. Maybe I'll try to get in there. Um, I do want to encourage folks, uh, and I'll drop the agenda for the uh, DDS employment work group. Do we have any employment work group members that are part of this meeting today? People that are actually on the work group for the Department of Developmental Services? I'm not sure that we, I'm not sure that we do, um, but I'll just share my screen real quickly. This is the uh, work group agenda. It's on May 22nd is when they're having it. It's from 1 to 2.30, and they're going to be going over career pathways to competitive integrated employment. So this is the new pilot project that hopefully we're going to hear about. Oh, Carol's got her hands up. You are part of the work group, aren't you, Carol? You have to unmute. Yes, I I am. Um, and yeah, it's a. Uh, what are exciting the exciting things? What, what can we expect? <laughs> Uh, well, we're going to hear from folks down in Orange County, Whittier yep. area, probably. Um, they've been doing some good transition work for a long time now. Um, but yeah, looking at some of the issues related to transition, which if you've been around me, you've heard for a long time. <laughs> um, but yeah, and uh, exciting to see what might come of it. Um, we, we, you know, we love, we love employment and our regional center has employment as, you know, one of our, um, strategic focus areas. Um, so we're very excited to see what the employment pilot is going to look like. Um, and so I, I, I will certainly, you know, the nice thing is, is that if you can't make these work group meetings, they record them and you can get that information and they also have the PowerPoints available, um, online as well. So that is the employment one. All right, I now want to jump over to our, uh, no, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to uh, directives from DDS. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen and we are going to talk about everyone's favorite topic, which is the rate study implementation. And so front page of DDS's website, you can navigate always to the directives to regional centers, right? The, I don't know, always, as long as they have it set up this way. Um, you can you can look at it that way. Uh, top one right there, percentage of rate adjustment used for wages and benefits for direct care staff. Um, we did not do a coffee with community services last week. So are you guys seeing that uh, very clearly there? All right, so this has been a topic of a conversation at our provider advisory committee meetings. Um, I think we've brought it up in this meeting as well. And I know some of you have reached out directly to or at least one of you reached out directly to Michelle Duchesne trying to get some additional information related to this. And what this is related to is the utilization of the rate adjustment. And many of you are aware um, when the Department of Developmental Services does some of their rate adjustments or rate increases, sometimes they make them conditional about certain things. You have to, for example, use it for staff wages or something like that. And so in this case, um, there is a directive from the department and um, this was because the language that was contained in last year's trailer bill, which is located right here um, on this link, my cursor was not, I don't think, quite clear enough to folks. And so now they've kind of broken it down even further and have also created a infographic kind of chart that also explains it as well. We have had some discussions internally, and I know that we've had, uh, we certainly had discussions amongst um, you know, some of the different regional centers as well. And I think this is about the best guidance that we can give you all directly as service providers related to this. Um, again, you're gonna have to, you know, yourselves take a look at how you are remaining in compliance with the, um, you know, statute and with regulation. And this is about the best guidance that we can give you in relation to this. I think, um, you know, we probably would have preferred that we had this a few months ago because it was, 
a question that came up during our provider advisory committee meeting about um, how it was supposed to be implemented. So just want to make sure you guys see in the chat, I have dropped the link to that and I want you to please make sure you take a look at that again. Um, DDS has made this abundantly clear um, in their the way they wrote the law and we want to ensure that everyone is kind of audit proof if there's any um, back auditing that is done of how you're utilizing the rate increases. All right, there's that information. And I want to go over now to the uh, May revision of the California budget. And what I am going to be using to share this information with you is what I feel to be right now the best document that describes all of this, which is the agenda for the state Senate budget hearings that was this week. And so this is um, uh, State Senate uh, sub three, and I'm going to go into sharing my screen here. And then I'm also going to drop in the chat a direct link to the agenda so that if you want to save it, follow along, figure out how much it ends up changing um, when we get our final budget in June, you can hold on to it. So. Um, explaining the California budget process, we're not quite there yet, folks. We've got another month about where before we're going to see an actual budget, but we have the budget that comes out at the beginning in January, and then we end up getting to where we're at, and there's budget hearings ahead of that, and then there is a May revision to the budget, and that's what we're going to talk about now, and that gives us usually a much better idea about what is going to come out in the budget trailer bills, um, and what are the things that are going to be, um, in the May revision. And so let me go over these real quick. And again, these are not set in stone, but this should give you a good indication of where things are moving towards as it relates to um, the California budget and services for people with developmental disabilities. A word of caution, it doesn't always work out that way though. In the past, there's things that have been in the May revision and they don't end up making it all the way. Um, if you are interested, the Department of Developmental Services did testimony both for the um, assembly budget committee um, with uh, Joaquin Arambula is the chair of that one and then um, also did it um, for the Senate as well and the Senate was the one that had um, Nancy Bargeman in it um, and it was good because she got into some specifics that were very interesting um, as it relates to some housing issues too. All right, um, enhanced federal funding. So state operated uh, facilities, um, they're looking at requested uh, decrease by 68, 681,000 and uh, reimbursements be increased by 681,000 one time to reflect estimated receipt of additional federal funds associated with the final state of emergency pandemic. Uh, other changes to the budget, coordinated family support services, they're requesting to increase it by $10.8 million um, to fund that program. Real quickly about coordinated family support services, we did hear that that service is going to have two separate rates. It is going to have the rate for the like facilitation type of activities, and they're gonna have a separate lower rate for the actual direct care activities that you're doing. So the coordinated family supports were not intention, you know, is, is it is not intention to replace something that is existing um, but we also know that people wanted some flexibility built into um, the how the service was delivered and whether or not the, there could be some direct services done. And so they said, yes, you can do that, um, but you're going to have to do things like exhaust the IHSS hours that exist. And now they are proposing putting forth a much lower rate. It'll probably be keyed off of the PA rate that is in um, the rate study. So we'll We'll wait and see what that final language looks like when it comes out from the department as well. And thank goodness Jason had not finalized any vendorizations yet because we would have to be doing all new uh, vendorizations for these new rates and having to tell people, sorry, we vendored you at a rate that's much higher than you're actually going to be able to get. And so sometimes when you do pilots like this, these are things that happen. And because things are rolling out very fast and very big with the department um, right now, um, it's uh, something that hopefully won't cause us any big hiccups on the vendorization process. Jason, I think we still have like seven in, uh, that have expressed interest, I believe. I have about nine now. I had two more this week. Okay, well, if anyone's on and now I change their minds because now you're going to be getting a lower <laughs> rate, I'm, I apologize. But good to know now rather than later on. Um, ILS rate fix. Boy, we've, we've been talking about yeah. that a little bit. Oh, Carol. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Hands up. 
question about that. So you said the so there will be one rate that is still this whatever fifty eight sixty four. Yeah. Um, for coordinated family services for the the initial intent of it, the initial description of it, and then another lower rate for actually direct service provision under that. Yeah, because they they wrote in direct service into the description of the service, but what they didn't do, I guess, was think that they probably should pay that at a lower level to dissuade people from using this higher rate service to do PA services instead of doing it to facilitate and coordinate the in-home family supports, which I think is more of what the intent of the pilot is. And so... Um, Again, let's wait and see what comes out from the department, possibly next week as it relates to it. But as of now, I think everyone's just on hold for new vendorizations, per se, um, until we find out what, what that's going to look like. There will be a directive about it, though. I know that. All right. And and how many how many PA services do you have a lot of people vendoring at that rate? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that we have a ton these days. Shocker. Not a fantastic rate, is it? So it it seems like that is not really going to be a a fix for what services that people are needing are. If if we're going to start vendoring, trying to vendor at, at rates that are not sufficient to get staffing. Yeah. Well, and again, this is good feedback for the because it's a pilot, right? the pilot, you know, intention is to study it and see how it gets rolled out and how it's utilized and how we utilize it in out of our Grass Valley office might be different than how it might be utilized in much uh, our more resourced areas, I should say. How about that? Um, all right. So independent living services it is requested um, that they increase 8.5 million and reimbursements uh, be increased by 6.5 million ongoing to fund the adjusted rate model assumptions for independent living services. So I know that there was a separate bill related to that that had been going through that had gone through to appropriations. And so um, I know many around here, including uh, Alta, were looking forward to the ILS rates getting um, fixed. And so it looks like we are on our way for that as well, possibly. Provisional eligibility for ages zero to two. Let's see. Um, they're going to put some trailer bill language out related to that as well. Um, requested uh, for a decrease for, oh gosh, $197 million ongoing. Um, it's related to federal grant funding for um, Early Start Program. They're going to do just a little change to the budget there. Let's see, enhanced federal funding, again, the COVID related, minimum wage adjustment. Um, let's see what else, anything exciting in these adjustments. HCBS allocation. Um, I think this is the one. Yeah, so this is the one that we are looking at, I believe the 50 additional staff um, at the regional centers across the state to do HCBS monitoring. Um, we do not, uh, we, we saw that that came through a budget change proposal and uh, we don't know exactly what that's gonna look like. We know we've got ex, you know excellent, um, you know, regular reviews that go on on the residential side of things, but um, there is no real clear, especially no statewide um, measures as it relates to all the other service codes that are HCBS um, required. And so um, we are kind of waiting to see what HCBS looks like from the Department of Developmental Services before we start a lot of our heavy activities. Um, but I will say I did get a presentation from the department last week and there will be significant activities that need to go on next fiscal year in order for us to quote unquote kind of verify compliance with with HCBS. So I know we talked about that a couple of weeks ago um, with Alicia, but it is uh, something we're looking forward to for next year. Uh, let's see, uh, community placement plan funding. So this is the one I really wanna talk with folks about. So this is uh, almost $10.8 million. And this is reallocating funds from 2020. So CPP funds uh, consist of kind of like three pots, startup funds, um, placement funds and assessment funds. And that's to move people primarily out of institutions. In 2020, because of COVID, there was not 
the money spent that they thought that they were going to spend. And so now they are going back to the legislature and they're asking to reallocate that money and for the purposes of doing one of my favorite things, which is developing more multifamily home projects. And so um, for those of you that are familiar with our projects, we have the Mirasol Village project where we already have two of our clients that have moved into those units and more clients are moving in um, you know, on a, on a rolling basis here. We have the project in Elk Grove um, as well uh, for 21 units that we're doing there. We have a project in uh, Woodland as well. And there's, uh, what do we do, uh, 16 units there. And we also have a project in Lake of the Pines located between Auburn and Grass Valley. And um, so I'm very encouraged by this reallocation of CPP funds because there's only like $21 million amongst the regional centers anyways that they get annually to do housing development. And this bumps it up, uh, you know, another almost $10.8 million. And that's a whole lot of units that we can set aside for people with developmental disabilities. So we're very excited about that. I, I called in and did uh, public testimony for that one as well. So um, looking forward to that. Let's see, um, increasing service coordinator supervisor salaries, the state equivalent salary for enhanced coordination, performance incentives and early start eligibility, and then more start training. And then the way these agendas work, you can see kind of some of the questions that they were asked to respond to. And then we get into um, the trailer bill language that is going to be proposed. And so again, the department will talk with uh, the legislature and kind of explain how they're planning on implementing some of these things. So parental participation requirement on ABA or intensive behavioral intervention. This trailer bill language is proposes to modify the requirements on providers and families for ABA services or intensive behavioral intervention services by encouraging but not requiring parent participation in services. I will not ask Camelia to give a comment on that one at all. Um, the next one is remote IFSPs and remote IPP meetings. And again, this is proposed language that is going to be in the trailer bill. We don't know what the final trailer bill will look like until next month, but it does give you an indication of some things. Um, existing law requires an individualized family support plan meeting to be held by remote electronic communications and allows an individual IPP plan to be held by remote communications if requested by the individual served or their family. And this proposal would extend that requirement through December 31st of 2023. So again, this is not solidified yet, but this is a proposal that is moving forth. As of right now, we plan for it to end at the end of the fiscal year, but looks like we may get an extension from the Department of Developmental Services. Um, oh, Denise is not on here. Um, but family home agencies. This proposal stipulates that regional center uh, reimbursement to family home agencies for services in a family home shall not exceed rates for individuals who reside in a community care facility vendored for four beds or less. So I think this is the FHA rate fix, right, that we've been kind of waiting for to be able to finally key the um, FHA rates off of the updated um, arm level rates, which that has not been going on. Arm level rates have been outpacing the um, vendorizations for the um, FHAs when they're newly vendored, they're required to get vendored at, you know, below that, that arm rate. And so um, this is good that they uh, are looking into that. So we'll uh, provide updates for folks uh, on that if it ends up coming to final fruition. Uh, the continued extension of the family cost participation program and the annual family program fee, um, they extended the um, uh, suspension for another six months. There's a lot of questions and including from myself about why they don't just cancel it. Um, it. I was listening to the testimony. It does not really generate a ton of revenue when you consider we're a $14.4 billion system next year. But um, regardless, they did extend it six months out. Um, it sounded like, again, that when I listened to the legislature folks, everyone just really wants to see, can we just end it? But the um, Department of Finance and others had not done all the scoring yet about the, the cost that it would lose, I guess. Uh, HCBS final rule directive authority cross-reference co uh, correction. The trailer bill language makes a technical change to update the department's ability to adopt regulations to implement and comply with HCBS final rules. Uh, expanding participant directed services for social rec and camping services. How cool would that be if we get that to pass um, and it allows us to do participant directed services 
um, for some of these things. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it ends up. We know that it's been a, a, such a challenge doing all the reimbursements um, through uh, service code 024 for a lot of these things. So we shall see. We do recognize, though, that every new participant directed service still needs a vendorization, though, um, by the regional center. Um, so that, that can be uh, a lot of work. We still certainly are trying to encourage folks to utilize our vendored providers that we already have for social recreation um, and camping, but we've also heard uh, loud and clear from, uh, I saw her on here earlier, Faye, our Associate Client Services Director, that a lot of these things are full and they're just not available um, to folks right now. They have wait lists though, for the ones that we've uh, vendored. Uh, the next one is new. Uh, this is in response to a lot of the community feedback and legislation that, or legislators' feedback that the Director of Developmental Services should have a wider ability to issue directives. So um, there was, there's a certain authority in health and, service, health and safety issues um, that the department is allowed to do directives. You guys see me share these directives all the time. These things are basically rules that come out to us that never have to go through any type of legislative or rulemaking process. It's just the statement of the Director of Developmental Services and then we have to do it. Um, and that allows us to do some things really fast, like um, changing COVID rules and things like that. Um, what this would allow is the authority for the director to um, establish statewide procedures relating to intake processes for eligibility determination, community engagement, and vendorization. These activities are, I would just, should not be a surprise to folks. People have been talking about standardizing vendorization amongst regional centers for quite some time. And that is certainly a, a large part of the discussion this year during the legislative session. Um, and certainly eligibility determination is another one that has, uh, and community engagement as well, have, have largely been talked about areas for more consistent practices by regional centers. And so um, there's certainly some work being done in that area. And there is an OWE request in here to give the Director of Developmental Services that authority to issue that uh, to the regional centers. Uh, let's see, changes to federal education grant funding, uh, complex residential needs program. I believe that is the ICFs that they were looking at putting on Fairview's campus, um, which would have allowed them to use um, injectable medications for clients. I just don't think that they have rounded out exactly what that language is going to look like and access to generic resources the discussion of the uh uh needing to get the appeal of the denial done um there's a bill by Lori wilson right now out of like solano county i think is where she's from and that was to um remove that old requirement that came out some of you remember before that came out but it was what 15 years ago or so that said we had to then um, do a appeal to those denials. So it doesn't look like they figured out exactly what that language is gonna look like, but that seems like something that is gaining momentum with this as well um, in this legislative session. And if you want to, you can continue to look through this document. It'll show you kind of what's going on for all the budget asks related to health and human services uh, type of uh, budget items. So that was, that was kind of what's going on. That's the biggest update that we can give as far as the, the budget. That's you know probably what you would have heard or much of it if you would have sat into the budget hearings and listened to them. Um, the Association of Regional Center Agencies certainly does advocate on behalf of a lot of these um, areas. I know that um, Rick Rollins and, and Amy Westling were both providing testimony, uh, public testimony at both, or public comment at both the Senate and the Assembly hearings. Um, any questions about the trailer bill or the um, May revision information. If folks know where to find it. Um, on DDS's website, a lot of this stuff is gonna end up getting posted. Uh, let's see here. Uh, if you go, I'm gonna share my screen so I can show you where it's at. All right. So if we go to DDS's website and you go to the transparency section and you go to the, whoops, I'm sharing my, I haven't shared my screen yet. Sorry about that. You go to DDS's website. And if you go to the transparency section, and that's where the budget information is. And this is really helpful because it's got all these past years 
of budget information as well. And then you can find information about the May revision in here too. So with that, any other questions as it relates to um, the budget or the trailer roll or anything? No? All right. Then I want to go to our um, events calendar at Alta here and share what we have upcoming. All right. So Michelle, we've got a adult day and employment vendor form coming up. Correct. Yeah, it is on the 25th from 10 to noon. And are we still looking for some agenda items? Um, we had, we are always welcome. You know, we're always taking more. We do have nine agenda items on right now. We do have um, Kate Halecki um, talking and presenting about the steering committee. And we also have Carol Watillo on there for our PCP training discussion as well. Perfect. <laughs> and um, again, if you click on these, you should be able to open it up and you can get the email addresses of the people to contact in order to submit agenda items. We have our upcoming uh, board of directors meeting. We have the housing survey and community forum. If you click on this here, um, State Council on Developmental Disabilities is uh, doing a forum on May 24th, and I will be joining uh, Anne de Medeiros and Peter Mendoza for that. We'll be talking about um, the feedback that we got. There's a survey that went out. Um, there's a, I've seen the, sur the survey responses have been given to me um, so that I can get some of that feedback as well. Um, and uh, I'll be prepared to talk about the, you know, the issues that come up in the feedback, and then also we'll kind of have an open forum discussion as well about housing and the things that, it, uh, the activities that the state council is doing, and then also what uh, Alta is doing specifically. So I want to encourage folks, if you're interested to attend that, it is um, 5.30 to 7.30, and the state council is doing uh, a lot of these types of forums. They did one on social recreation a couple months ago, and we certainly want to really support their activities um, as it relates to this. So we have that coming up. And additionally, we have the Punjabi American Festival that is coming up as well. We have the California Hands and Voices is having their activity on uh, Sunday, May 21st too. Event for all ages and all modalities hosted by California Hands and Voices. And then we have a public meeting for CBAM. Um, Jordan, why are we doing a public meeting for CBAM? At this time, the regional center is requesting um, that we waive the, um, some of the rates requirements in the Welfare and Institution Code so we can look at modifying CBAM's contract from a contract rate to the monthly median rate. Um, as many of our providers, um, right, have, have struggled with uh, being able to maintain qualified staff throughout the pandemic and just in regards to, you know, the current state um, that we have with rates and, and getting qualified staff. So uh, we're looking forward to presenting that information to the public on the 31st. Thank you very much, Jordan. There, and that information is contained within, if you if you click on it, you can see that information in there. You might notice again, that we're really trying to round out our calendar here. This is kind of new for us to try to have so many of the different events on here. Um, so just wanna, I appreciate all the work that folks are doing to do our outreach uh, activities. Carol Watillo, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen real quick. Go ahead, Carol. Um, I just wanted to double check the uh, uh, adult day and employment forum is it only virtual or is it hybrid or i wasn't clear i'm i'm uh, gonna ask michelle for that one michelle are you guys doing are you guys planning on doing it hybrid or doing it all zoom it is all zoom um moving forward we are you know definitely open to hybrid and that's something we can discuss but this one will be only only on Zoom. And I have updated that agenda item. Thank you for that, Carol. Okay, great. I'm get, I'm we're we're getting confused. Some of them we we like. People really want us there. Other ones, people are like, yeah, no, don't come. We'll do it all on Zoom. <laughs> awesome. All right. Um so it's 11:53. I'm gonna check the chat right now and see what else we got in the chat, if anything. 
All right. I don't see anything else in the chat that is not covered yet. Um, let's see. Anything else, folks? Any questions that folks have? I will say um, I did get a presentation by DDS related to the rate study implementation last week. Um, you know, we're at a point where we are, you know, uh, not too much more than a year out from having standardized rates. Um, and that's, you know, some of our, you know, whether it's transportation, whether it's supportive living providers, um, we've got different ways that our rates are set up for some of our different providers. And we are getting to a point where we are going to have to standardize everyone because everyone is going to have the same way, the same rates other than whatever geographic differences are calculated by the department. And so um, that being said, you know, we've already got the crosswalk. We already know service codes like 055, um, um, the, or service code 063, the Com Community Activity Support Services, will probably just go away um, or largely will go away because of some of the different um, categories. But I just will tell you all as providers, there's supposed to be a robust stakeholder input that is supposed to go on before the, the, the standardization of these different things so that they can hear from folks. And I just, it seems like that's gonna get really, really compressed over this next year um, because there's so many different rates and service codes that need to get changed over. There's just a, like an immense amount of them. And we're definitely at the regional center trying to prepare ourselves for that um, and staffing up some of our different positions in community services. Um, to do that because it's going to be that and then it's also going to be hcbs compliance kind of at the same time um, next fiscal year and so just a heads up you know we will keep you as providers as informed as possible um but you know we already have had issues with providers being concerned about what happens when those rates get standardized and and the rate study implementation you know truly kind of goes into effect um, there is still the hold harmless period that is going to exist through 2026. But um, regardless, there's just gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of work that we are doing. And, and once again, we're also gonna have to make sure that when we're moving people's service codes around and, and, and categorizing things, that we don't make any mistakes. We wanna ensure that we're having communication really clearly with you as providers, and we can be as transparent as possible with how we decided to categorize things that are going to need to change. And so, I know last time we were able to work it out so that Robin LeMay was able to share people's uh, spreadsheets and we were able to offer opportunities for people if they didn't think that their um, rates were classified appropriately. And so just know that we will do everything that we can do to try to get this as accurate as possible for you all and also to try to create the most sustainable rates possible for you as well as service providers. So we. Uh, you know, Jordan, unfortunately, with her specialized unit, ends up with all the kind of outlier vendorizations that don't really make sense in the rate study. And so she's trying to do some advocacy on the health and safety waiver, or you heard about the 637 just now, things to help some of these providers. So um, again, it's coming and uh, definitely know that we are going to be here to support you and, you know, walk people through that whole process. All right. Uh, and with that, um, I want to share that though it is a holiday weekend next weekend, we are definitely going to be having uh, coffee with community services. So we will look forward to seeing everyone next Friday, those of you that have not decided to go on vacation a little bit early. And uh, hope everyone has a great uh, rest of their day and a great weekend. And the recordings of this will be online in, uh, probably next week. All right. Thank you, folks. Good Friday. Bye.